Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us at today's CPC conference. My name is Stephanie, and I will be monitoring things here on the back end. Uh, just a reminder, uh, you can claim your um, CME credits uh, by going to the My CME uh, webpage. Uh, it's approved for one credit and one, one um, APA credit. I will also be passing out or sending a link to our Qualtrics evaluation. So if you have time, please fill that out. We definitely value everyone's opinions, um, any comments, so we can keep these things going and make sure everybody is feeling active and engaged. And with that, I will turn things over to Dr. Roger Alvin. Okay, thanks. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, so um, I'm gonna present the clinical history um, part of this this interesting CPC. Now, a little handicapped in that um, this individual had been seen by a number of our clinicians, but initially before our present electronic medical record system was established, and I was unable to recover his initial evaluation notes. So this is reconstructed from some of the subsequent notes. And in any case, this gentleman was in his late 50s around the time of the onset of his problem. And I want to gather he presented with a somewhat a slightly unusual constellation of clinical features. Um, what's prominently mentioned in his notes are diminished memory function. There is at least one or I think several episodes of getting, for example, getting lost when driving. Also described as having a marked change in personality and becoming much more apathetic. There's a comment by his spouse that he had been a, quote, fun person, unquote, and had just sort of lost interest in all his usual activities. And then finally, he developed a significant problem with alcohol abuse quite late in life, around the time of the onset of this problem, um, quite uncharacteristic for him. Um, he was evaluated in late 2011, early 2012. Uh, clearly, it was concerned about dementia leading to his evaluation. He had presumably had a normal general physical and neurologic examination at that time because his, um, the, the exams the subsequent uh, few years were normal as well. And, and, it, and the initial evaluation consisted of the usual um, blood work and imaging. And then for further characterization, um, neuropsychology testing was, was scheduled, which will be discussed later, and PET imaging was ordered. And let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. So just as a quick review, this is from a actually from a review article written by some of our nuclear medicine faculty. This is the normal pattern of, um, of glucose uptake on FDG PET. And what you can see is it's basically, it's a marker for um, gray matter. Um, you can see both the, this is the normal cortical and subcortical distribution of, of uh, glucose uptake. And I the way this is usually interpreted is that um, what's what really drives uh, energetic demand in the in neural tissue is the the, um, the need to maintain normal ionic gradients, particularly following synaptic uh, neurotransmission. And you can think of this method as really sort of a measure of synaptic mass. Yeah. Um, now that may not be entirely correct uh, as we've learned from some other subsequent PET tracers, but, but this is at least at, at a minimum, a measure of synaptic dysfunction. And in some, to some extent is probably a measure of synaptic loss as well on a regional basis. Um, now, key things here to look at, which are often useful, is that in general, in a normal individual, the cortical mantle and major subcortical structures like the striatum and the thalamus should have approximately about the same uptake. Um, next slide, please. And again, this is from the same review article. This is sort of the, uh, the canonical patterns of deficits that are seen in a variety of, of neurodegeneration. So starting with AD, the, the typical pattern is a prido-occipital deficit, which you can see particularly in the lateral temporal cortex, uh, prido, I should say prido-temporal deficit, particularly in the lateral temporal cortex. And on the medial views, you can see involvement of the posterior cingulate cortex and the precuneus as well, which are also characteristic. Um, dementia with Lewy bodies looks very similar, with the exception of, of uh, what's well-described finding is there's often a additional um, hypometabolism, diminished glucose uptake within occipital cortex, which you can see there as well. And FTD, depending on the specific FTD syndrome, has, has some different patterns, but most cases of FTD will have frontal hypometabolism. And then you can see the rare entities of CBD and, and PCA, which we're not going to talk about or describe there as well. Next slide, please. 
So this is this gentleman's FEG PET result. Now, um, our colleague in nuclear medicine, Kirk Fry, was kind enough to uh, retrieve the original image data and then reprocess it and um, then put it through a, 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 a data, data system that wasn't available at the time and he was initially studied, which is over 10 years, over a decade ago. And this is his PET imaging matched against a database of, of normal age match controls. And what you can see here is identified in these um, violet to purple colors are the areas of, of hypometabolism. And there's two particularly prominent findings. Um, one is the deficits within the posterior cingulate and to some extent the precuneus region. And the second is a quite distinctive finding in the medial temporal lobe. Um, roughly corresponding to the perihippocampal gyrus. And you can see that in, in some of the, the images, um, the cross-sectional images in the lower right there. Um, next slide, please. And this is just a blow up to show you some of the, the, um, the more prominent findings. You can see here, particularly on the right, in the right column, you can see the very prominent um, posterior cingulate and to some extent precuneous hypometabolism. And in the lower um, image in the right column, you can see the very prominent hypometabolism within the medial temporal lobe. Now, this is quite an unusual pattern, and um, it, was, it was quite well described by the nuclear medicine physician who initially interpreted this study um, without this kind of image analysis software, and they suggested a diagnosis of PICS disease. Um, next slide, please. Um, when Kirk Fry was looking at these images, he also noticed something else, which is that this is something you would only see if you were an experienced uh, interpreter. He felt there was actually some increased uptake of, or increased activity within the striatum. So what you can see here in the, the fire color, the yellow to the yellow to, um, to red colors is actually, these are areas where there would be increased metabolism. And in particular, um, there was increased metabolism as he felt from the initial qualitative evaluation within the striatum. You can see that particularly in the caudates. And this is a finding that's actually associated, was described many years ago in individuals who have some kind of dopaminergic deficit. So you can get this kind of finding either in Parkinson's disease and related disorders, or you can see this with, um, with individuals who have Parkinsonism from dopamine antagonist administration. So striatal hypermetabolism. Next slide, please. Now, um, the initial diagnosis of this individual after evaluation was behavioral variant FTD. And he was followed for a number of years subsequently, and I'll just go through some of the summary from the clinic visits. So you can see when he was seen in November of, of 2012, he had intact ADLs, but his IADLs were quite impaired. Normal physical examination continued to have significant problems with uh, alcohol abuse. Um, seen approximately six months later, it's described in the notes as having worsening memory function and continuing quite a substantial apathy, again, persistent alcohol abuse, um, apathetic to the point of view that his spouse had to remind him to eat and take his medications. Um, they did, however, report some improvement on a relatively low dose of denepazil. Next slide, please. And here are some of the follow-up notes. Uh, March of 2014, who was felt to have stable memory dysfunction, apathy, continued alcohol abuse, was at this point manifesting some visuospatial dysfunction sim symptoms. Um, he's described as having problems with navigating around in his home, a long familiar environment. In fall of that year, he was felt to have stable features on examination, but was described as having inappropriate behavior in public. And in um, the summer of 2015, apparently manifested significant difficulties with anxiety and paroxetine was a, as initiated as a therapy. Next slide, please. Um, in January of 2016, um, he, it was very well documented in the notes that he had developed, or this was first detected, that he was having dream and acting behavior, which is very mm -hmm. well described by his spouse. Um, in the fall of that year, he had possible language dysfunction, again, was exhibiting some inappropriate behavior. His spouse described him as becoming somewhat sexually more demanding, not always in an appropriate context. And um, in the winter of um, 2017, he was documented as having significant visual hallucinations and illusions. He was having more frequent dream and acting behavior. And at that point, he was described as having mild Parkinsonism on examination. Um, 
And over the subsequent two years um, that he was followed, year or two he was followed, these these continued to be persistent features, though though gradually worsening. And then was deceased in the in the summer of 2019. So next slide, please. I just want to comment on the late onset alcohol abuse. Um, this is from a, a clinic series, the UCSF group, um, the memory clinic there. This is based on um, an individual is defined by NAC criteria as, as having Alzheimer's disease or, or FTD variants. And in general, they see late onset alcohol abuse in a small fraction of their, of their case series. When this occurs, it's substantially more likely to occur in behavioral variant FTD. And AAFS stands for alcohol abuse as first symptom. Again, much more likely to occur in behavioral variant FTD than individuals classified as AD. And I think this is just an example of what I think is a general principle. When you see a late onset of a, of a significant psychiatric disorder, you should suspect that there's an underlying neurodegeneration going on. Next slide. So what we're left with, it, if you look through his chart, the various clinicians who saw him had a variety of, discussed a variety of diagnoses. And what we're left with is uh, an individual's prominent early memory dysfunction, which is something we associate with AD pathology. Um, he also had significant apathy and disinhibition, late onset of alcohol abuse, somewhat younger onset of his, of his syndrome. Again, these are all features that we commonly see in, in um, behavioral variant FTD. I put AD in parentheses there because both in my personal experience and also I think in the literature, when you see individuals with this kind of constellation of, of, um, of features, it's true, they, they frequently have um, FTD pathology, you know, tauopathy or TD, you know, variety of those kind of pathologies underlying their syndrome. But in a high percentage, significant fraction actually have AD pathology, but it more expressed uh, frontally. And then later in his course, he developed RBD features, visual hallucinations, um, visuospatial dysfunction, and was found to have mild Parkinsonism, which again, um, particularly the dream and acting behavior, which is quite specific for dementia with Lewy bodies or related disorders, suggests that this would there would be a component of that as well. I put the Parkinsonism in parentheses because the fact this appears to have developed later in this course, and that's less informative. Um, certainly individuals with FTD, it's not unusual for them to develop Parkinsonism, and you can see that in advancing Alzheimer's disease as well. Um, Next slide, please. However, you know, as is often these multiple CNS pathologies are the rule, not the exception. Um, so it wouldn't be surprising if this individual had more than one kind of pathology at autopsy. And what's the basis for that? Well, this could simply be coincidence. These are common things that occur in, in, in aging brains. There are suggestions that having one type of pathologic process actually feeds the others. There's there are old, older suggestions that there's cross seeding of of uh, abnormal, abnormally conformed proteins. And then sort of a general idea that if you have one type of, um, of, of proteinopathy, this will actually disrupt cells, stress cells, and consequently they're less likely to be able to cope with other types of proteinopathies. So next slide, please. And I'm just gonna finish up with two things talking about returning back to his pen imaging. Now this is from a um, case series from the Mayo Group. It's from the Mayo Brain Bank. Um, this is actually retrospective analysis of individuals who had, um, comparing individuals who had um, in their, in their, at autopsy had significant late as compared to those who didn't. And the comparisons you're seeing here is on the, with FDG PET and MRI are the difference between individuals who had late, the tau op, the TDP op, TDP 43 opathy versus the, the ones who didn't. And in general, those who have the prominent late pathology seem to have this, particularly have this medial temporal lobe hypometabolism and MR atrophy. And next slide, please. And more anecdotally, also from the, the Mayo group, um, this is um, some FDG PET studies based on a few of uh, three of their subjects. The two in the left actually are, are individuals who had PET imaging, which um, with with tau and amyloid tracers, which were negative, but had an amnestic syndrome. And what you can see, in fact, is that they have medial temporal hypometabolism and posterior cingulate hypometabolism, very similar to what our subject had in his initial study. And in the right column, this is an individual who at autopsy had late, uh, very you know modest um, uh, AD pathology, 
And again, what you're seeing there in his, his FTG PET study obtained sometime before death is this medial temporal lobe hypometabolism and posterior cingulate hypometabolism. So again, this would be consistent with what was seen in our, our subject. And um, I'll stop there. Roger, can I ask two questions? Um, yeah. One, was there a family history of dementia? Not that I, no, no, there wasn't. Okay. okay. And yeah. the, mm -hmm. so the posterior cingulate hypometabolism that we often talk about, mm -hmm. uh, you're suggesting that really it is not very specific for a, a, a particular mm -hmm. disorder. Yeah, that's um, right. So that, that's an interesting, potentially interesting story in two ways. So first of all, number one, this has been argued to be a specific feature for AD, but in fact, that's the point of that last um, relatively short anecdotal thing from the Mayo group. They're saying, no, you can't say that. Now, there's a back potential background to this, which they actually mean, I don't think they're actually aware of, which is that um, this is quite a few years ago. Uh, Satoshi Minishima, who was on our faculty here in nuclear medicine a number of years ago, and who is the guy who developed that software package that we use for the for the analysis of FDG data. Um, I don't, Satoshi had some, I don't think he actually ever published this, but he had an FDG study of individuals who had undergone temporal lobectomy for um, epilepsy. And in those individuals, you actually see posterior cingulate hypometabolism, presumably as a downstream, you know, diaschesis effect. I see, so. It's possible. Yeah, it could be. This is could be a reflection of the temporal pathology. And the final question I have for you, um, yeah. why would someone have called that looking to be a pattern consistent with fixed disease? Uh, I I don't know. Okay. Um, so that was I just, will, maybe they knew clinically the person had what looked to be a behavioral variant. And Yeah, I, I suspect that's what it was. I will say that the, the description of the, the, the interpretation without the software was entirely consistent with what the software shows. Just the diagnosis, I agree with you, it's a little funny. It wasn't interpreted. It was interpreted by one of our very competent nuclear medicine physicians who is not a neurologist. I will say that. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can turn things over to Dr. Sarah Plummer. Sarah, you're muted. Please unmute Sarah so we can hear yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. How about now I do my whole introduction? We're good? Okay. Um, so yeah, my name is Sarah Plummer. I'm a first year postdoctoral fellow at the Ann Arbor VA. And I'll be presenting the data from two neuropsych evaluations, uh, one from 2011 and one from 2012. All right. So uh, his first evaluation was in 2011 and he was age 58 at the time. Uh, he had 16 years of education and he was working as a general manager and route planner for delivery trucks. So he and his wife said that he had been having cognitive problems for about two years and they attributed it to a uh, colon cancer surgery that he underwent in 2009. He was originally referred for a brief cognitive screener and I don't have the specific score that he earned on that screener, but it was described to be sufficiently low enough to warrant a full neuropsych evaluation. I also saw in some notes that he took another cognitive screener and he actually earned a perfect score on that one. So it looks like there was some variability at that time. And just some quick background, there was some mixed information on family history, but his mother may have had Alzheimer's disease or Lewy body dementia. And he had an older sister who was in her 60s at that time who was also reporting some memory problems. He had a history of depression and anxiety and he was on Xanax and Trazodone for uh, mood and sleep problems. And regarding his substance use, he reported drinking a couple of beers about four times a week and six or more beers in a single setting about once a month. So in the interview, he described uh, forgetting the day and date, uh, forgetting names of people and having problems at work, like forgetting appointments or meetings. He said that he was losing his train of thought in conversations. 
And again, he said these problems started in 2009 after those surgeries. They initially improved, but then remained stable. And he and his wife agreed that he never really returned to um, his prior baseline where he was before those surgeries. Uh, in the report, it said that he was not having problems with ADLs or IADLs at the time, um, but he did say that his performance at work declined and his anxiety was also getting worse. His forgetfulness was embarrassing for him, and he also described his personality as more guarded than before. Um, he also reported some depressive symptoms like reduced interest in hobbies and activities. He did complete uh, another MMSC, uh, which is the mini mental state exam cognitive screener at that time. He got a 27 out of 30, which as an overall score is not suggestive of cognitive impairment, but it was noted that he missed all of the points on the delayed recall items for the word list. And I'll be presenting the test results from the evaluation in just a minute. Um, the results will be shown on a normal curve to give an idea for how well or how poorly the patient did on these different tests in the different domains. And lower scores are going to be on the left side and higher scores will be on the right side. That yellow to red gradient represents the area where the scores start to fall into the impaired range. And there's some debate, but you know, oftentimes people use uh, you know, 1.5 to two standard deviations below the mean to be considered to be in that impaired range. So that's how we'll be interpreting it today. So his premorbid IQ was estimated to be high average based on a test of word reading. And for the most part, his scores were average or better across most of the domains. You can see over here in the um, green areas, attention, working memory, processing speed, visual spatial skills, and most areas of executive functioning and language. But looking over to that left side at those lower scores, you can see a cluster of uh, learning and memory scores, particularly for verbal information. So his verbal immediate memory was below average uh, when asked to learn a list of words, and it was exceptionally low for learning some short stories. And after a short delay, his memory for both the list and the stories were exceptionally low. For the stories, he recalled only one detail out of the 50 possible details. And for the list, he recalled only one word from the list of 12 words that had been presented to him three times. His recognition scores were essentially a chance and he tended to have a lot of false positives. So he was incorrectly saying yes, that he recognized words as target words when they were not words actually from that list. Uh, for his visual information, his immediate memory was low average, but his recall of a figure after a delay was below average, which is more towards that impaired range. And he also had low performance on one of the verbal fluency tasks. You can see there's quite a discrepancy between his average letter fluency and his exceptionally low category fluency. And on motor tasks at the bottom there, um, his scores were uh, also variable. They were low for tapping with both hands and they were high for Groot pegboard for both hands. And he had no elevations on any of the mood measures that they provided, um, things like anxiety and depression. He wasn't really reporting a lot of, at least on the measures. All right, so just you know, to take a, a quick poll, I'd like to hear you know what diagnoses are coming to mind, and what are people thinking that they would you know diagnose this person with? Um, I think the poll should yeah, perfect, come up. You must have all your votes by now. Yeah, I would guess the little, yeah, okay, now it pops up. So it looks like most people are thinking AD, um, some in uh, MCI. If, would anyone want to jump in and just make a quick comment about the most important information that guided, you know, this selection? 
I voted for MCI because functionally it sounds like he's generally intact, but I would have a lot of concern for AD based mm -hmm. on his pattern of performance. Right? The primary deficits and delayed recall, poor recognition, lots of false positives, low semantic relative to phonemic fluency. Those mm -hmm. all look very classic AD to me. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for jumping in on that. Um, I was just going to add that um, the murky distinction between MCI and dementia is murky. And I agree with what uh, Cynthia had to say. Um, despite some of the scores and some of the reports, I would still be very concerned. In fact, there is functional impairment in this individual that would meet criteria. Now, whether it's Alzheimer's or not, based on Roger's pre pre you know, presentation, I think it's uh, up in the air. But um, clinically, to me, I, I went with Alzheimer's disease. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for your thoughts on that. And um, so just moving uh, ahead in the slides, this is what the uh, evaluator concluded. So there was no specific diagnosis provided, but they did note that his presentation and performance reflected some general cognitive problems. Obviously, there were problems with memory that showed up on the testing. And in terms of why this might be the case, uh, chemotherapy, low mood, poor sleep, and alcohol use were noted as likely contributors to his cognitive complaints. And those were identified as the primary targets for intervention. But still, the evaluator noted that there's that mood and these other factors that I mentioned wouldn't fully explain his very poor memory performances. So they recommended that he work on mood, alcohol use, and sleep, and then come back in for a reevaluation a year later. So he did come back in. So uh, when he was 59 in 2012, he came back for a, a neuropsych evaluation and he and his wife reported that the forgetfulness was getting worse. He was starting to repeat himself more regularly and the memory problems were getting so severe that they were causing significant problems at work. So again, he, was, um, he worked planning routes for truck drivers. And at this point he was actually at risk of losing his job. And in terms of his personality and mood and behavior, he was described as becoming increasingly with reserved, even more withdrawn. And his wife added that he wasn't showing the typical sense of control that he had before, and he was starting to make weird comments. I don't really have details on what those weird comments were. Um, I know everyone's probably curious about that. Um, but it sounds like there have been some behavioral changes as well over that past year. And when he was retested on the mini mental state exam, he got a 25 out of 30. Again, he missed the delayed recall for that word list and he got a couple of items wrong on orientation as well. So um, here's a you know, chart of the data. On this chart, the grayed out boxes indicate his score on the initial evaluation in 2011, if there was enough of a difference to graphically depict it here. And overall, you can see there's a pretty similar pattern to the first evaluation with most scores and domains in the average range or above. He didn't have that discrepancy anymore between verbal fluency for letters and categories. You can see it in the middle there in that average range. But over to the left, you can still see that cluster of verbal learning and memory scores in the impaired range. And after a delay, he recalled zero words from that 12 word list that he heard three times. And for the short stories, he provided only three of the 50 possible details. And again, there were no elevations on uh, measures of depression, anxiety, or any sort of mood problems. So I was gonna ask again um, about diagnosis and to see if people change their opinions at all, just for the sake of time, we can go ahead and skip that one. But I'd just like you to think about you know, if this information changes what you think or you think it's more severe or maybe a different etiology. But ultimately this evaluator did not provide a specific diagnosis, but acknowledged that memory impairment Regarding etiology, the evaluator noted that there were possible neurological processes, um, possibly a perineoplastic syndrome, which would be a disorder that's associated with an immune reaction to cancerous tumors. And uh, they said that there's a remote possibility that this represents a neurodegenerative process, particularly given the family history of either um, Alzheimer's or Lewy body dementia in his mother. 
and that overall the prognosis for improvement at work and just in general was described as not optimistic. So they were thinking that this is something that is not gonna get any better. And that was his uh, last neuropsych evaluation that he had, but he did complete a series of cognitive screeners for the years following um, from 2013 to 2017. You can see it, you know, generally a downward trend there. And he was pretty consistently missing that delayed recall, again, showing problems with that memory. All right, so that's all I had for the neuropsych data. Uh, happy to answer any questions. All right, looks like we're all set. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, hi, my name is Kyle Conway. I'm one of the neuropathologists that uh, works in the ADRC. And uh, I think this is a really interesting case just to kind of uh, start out my presentation of the, Neuropathology, um, just I think this is a great case for illustrating the fact that, uh, as Roger kind of alluded to, there are off mixed pathology is is really, especially now, the rule rather than the exception. Um, and we have kind of this battery of new um, pathologic diagnoses that we can make and and that kind of accumulate. So this is this is a really great case for kind of illustrating um, how some of those things fit together with the the clinical picture. So, We'll start off with the the gross or macroscopic examination. Uh, I think, you know, so with these with these cases, we usually examine them as as one half of the brain. The other half is um, is frozen for for other studies. And so this this weight here, which is the weight of the of the full brain, I think this is kind of really notable right off the bat that this is a essentially a normal weight brain, and you're gross examination here is that there's there's really no from our from our perspective the autopsy perspective no uh gross atrophy cortical atrophy um you can kind of appreciate the same thing from this uh mid sagittal section and then we section the brain coronally to look uh to look more specifically and here's kind of a nice section that has a lot of a lot of different things going on here and i would say uh, the first thing that pops out to me is there is this lateral ventricle is dilated. We usually see that in cases with a lot of atrophy. And again, I, you know, I'm not necessarily appreciating tons of atrophy. The limbic structures are a little bit more atrophic relative to the, to the cortical atrophy. So this is the hippocampus right here. It usually sits very flush against the uh, temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. And here we have some space, which is usually kind of an indication that it's atrophic. So on a on a semi semi quantitative scale, I would say this is moderately atrophic, and then really notably, um, which maybe doesn't necessarily uh, fit totally into you know isn't super relevant to our discussion here or is partially relevant. He has these um, these superficial uh, kind of somewhat cavitary hemorrhagic lesions, which are really up in the cortex, mostly in the temporal. There's one here, but there were there were several in the temporal lobe. The other important part of our uh, gross examination, this is the substantia nigra right here. So this is this is midbrain. Um, and it's there's mild depigmentation of the substantia nigra. So this is composed of uh, pigmented neurons, and when they when they die, you lose this pigment. And I just have an example of a case that uh, is completely depigmented and a normal control. So you can see that we're we're probably more like the normal control than the depigmented one, but a little bit of loss of, of neurons there. So to move on, uh, in these cases, we sample the brain extensively. We take sections from many different regions. And uh, you know we always start our examination with uh, hematoxylin and eosin, which is our basic stain for just looking at what's going on. And then we move on to immunohistochemistry to look for specific uh, abnormal protein aggregates. And for our purposes here, that's really how our, we make our neurodegenerative diagnoses are, are looking at what proteins are aggregating and what cells and what regions of the brain. So uh, to kind of quickly go through, I think the important parts on the, on the H and E, uh, this is a section of frontal cortex. This is the peel surface up here and then cortex down here. There's a little bit of rarefaction of the cortex typically. Um, so it's just a little bit 
whiter and a little bit kind of a bumpier surface, which usually indicates uh, some degree of atrophy. So I would say it looks microscopically a little bit more atrophic than, than it did grossly. Here's the hippocampus, and I have the different uh, regions labeled. So this is this is Ammon's horn, uh, which we separate into the uh, CA4, CA3, CA2, and CA1 layers. The most important thing to look at here is that all these little blue dots are neurons, and it should kind of have a nice continuous band, which I think you can see right here, that band drops off. There's an absence of neurons right here. If we go to higher power, we can see all our little neurons here. And then this is essentially, you know, edema and, and parenchymal loss and reactive astrocytes. So this is really, if you just had this by itself, pathologically, this is what historically we would call hippocampal sclerosis. And I'll kind of go on to discuss that a little bit later on here. We look at the substantia nigra. These are all those pigmented neurons I alluded to. Uh, there's a few areas where we just have pigment kind of by itself out in the parenchyma. That indicates that we've had the death of pigmented neurons. And uh, some of the neurons have these little um, concentric cytoplasmic inclusions that if you know what those are, it gives you a clue to what um, we will see later, but I'll come back to them. And then that uh, superficial kind of cavitary lesion just really looks like a, like a hemorrhage. So it looks relatively acute here. Um, but he does have some sort of hemorrhage in his superficial cortex, probably occur that occurred later than his most recent, um, you know, MMSC um, that he had performed. So let's go kind of step by step through the diagnoses that we can establish here. We always think the first thing we want to think about is is assessing for Alzheimer's disease, and we look for two proteins there. We look for amyloid, beta amyloid, and tau, and the way that we pathologically classify and diagnose uh, Alzheimer's disease is, is three different criteria. We look at the thal phase, which is where is their amyloid, the neuritic plaque score, the CIRAD score, which is what's the density of amyloid, uh, and then our Brock stage, which is where is their tau, how has the tau expanded. So we'll start off with the amyloid and the amyloid to make a, to, to establish a thal phase. We, you know, there are, it's, there are some kind of convoluted um, assessments that that are described, uh, but in the most the simplest way you can think about this is that amyloid starts in the cortex and it kind of progresses downward through the limbic the striatum and the limbic structures uh, into the brainstem and cerebellum. So if we can get into the cerebellum, we're kind of at the highest uh, thal phase. Oh, and I should go back. I didn't I didn't mention this, but um, we put all these together into this table, which gives us a an outcome of uh, low, intermediate, or high level of Alzheimer's disease neuropathologic change. And we typically think of intermediate and high as being a, an adequate explanation for dementia. So I'll just kind of quickly go through where we're seeing amyloid. Uh, here's the frontal cortex, and we have tons and tons of parenchymal amyloid deposits. We also have some of these vascular amyloid deposits that I'll, that I'll come back to uh, later on. At higher power, we have two forms of amyloid. These are diffuse plaques, which are just parenchymal deposits, and these are neuritic plaques, um, which are essentially uh, uh, will be also tau positive, and these are the uh, in the cores of neurons. Um, when we get to our CIRAD score, our density score, we really care about the density of these neuritic plaques. So I'm just going to kind of show you a few different areas that we had amyloid. It was in the striatum quite extensively. Uh, the nucleus basalis, uh, which, is a, which is an important basal forebrain structure. That's kind of a part of the progression of uh, what's described in the, in the thal um, phase system. And then in the hippocampus, um, this is uh, slightly askew from my last picture, but here's our, our dentate gyrus. And I just wanted to kind of indicate, uh, you know, here's our, our CA layers, and, the, and it would wrap kind of all the way up and around here. And there's uh, abundant amyloid uh, throughout the hippocampus and limbic structures. And then I'm just going to kind of skip ahead to the most important part, which is that we have uh, amyloid deposits in the cerebellum. This is our granular cell layer and our molecular layer, um, and it's in both. So it's kind of at the interface here, which is where it commonly is, and then in the granular cell layer. So um, if you look at the paper published by the, thal, the original thal phase uh, paper, essentially cerebellar amyloid is, is diagnostic of your highest thal phase, which is phase five. So if we go back to our little chart here, we're at, we would assign this an A3, the highest uh, thal, the highest A score uh, based on that thal phase. If we want to count the density of our neuritic plaques, 
Um, I will just tell you that this is, it's, it's kind of a semi-quantitative evaluation, but there's tons and tons and tons of neuritic plaques in the cortex. So this counts as, as, a, as what we would call frequent or a C3 by the CIRAD score. So you can kind of see here, once you're at where we are now, what really matters for telling us how much AD pathology we have is, um, is going to be our Brock stage. It's going to be our extent of tau pathology. Now, Brock, uh, in contrast to amyloid, starts out in the around the transentorhinal cortex and extends up. So that would be stage one. I'm not sure if, by the way I'm sharing, you can't see the stages up here. Um, stage two of Brock, stage three, once it kind of starts to get out into this occipitotemporal gyrus and, and uh, into the temporal cortex, that's stage four. Um, and then stage five is, is into the neocortex. And stage six, or the kind of most advanced stage of tau pathology in, in Alzheimer's, uh, is involving a, a primary cortex. But we, for, the, for our purposes, the, the, the best one to sample at the time of autopsy and easiest to identify is the primary visual cortex. So if we have involvement of the primary visual cortex, uh, that's our highest Brock stage. So here's a tau stain on the hippocampus, and it is densely positive. If we go to higher power, there's a lot of good things we can see here. This is a pre-tangle right here that has this kind of granular tau um, deposition. That's not diagnostic of Alzheimer's pathology, but you commonly see it along with it. What you really want to see are these, which are neurofibrillary tangles that have this kind of um, more dense longitudinal distribution. This little chunky stuff here is the core of a neuritic plaque. So if we did our amyloid on this, on this uh uh, slide, we would see a neuritic plaque right there. And then for me, I think one of the most important things to see is this dense background net network of neuropil threads. So as you have tau extending along uh, out, of the, uh, out of the body of the neuron, it forms this dense network, which is really what indicates for me that there's good uh, uh, Alzheimer's type pathology here. So we have Alzheimer's pathology, neurofibrillary pathology in the hippocampus. So let's move outward along that Brock staging into our um, this would be uh, um, kind of leaving the, the transentorhinal cortex would be over here, and then we're into that temporo-occipital gyrus. So this has gotten us up to about a Brock stage three to four at this point. If I show you the frontal cortex, also this very dense network of tau pathology. I always kind of tell trainees, like, when there's, when there's a really severe uh, Alzheimer's case, you can look at the slide. You don't even need the microscope. The slide will be brown um, like this would be here. And then the last part of this, um, this right here is the primary visual cortex. Um, and so we're, we're really very, very comfortably into a Brock stage six here. So that's, that's this um, primary visual cortex down here. And if we put all the pieces together in here, um, this comes out uh, very confidently to a, to a high level of Alzheimer's disease neuropathologic change. Now there's a little bit more going on here. Um, so the next thing we want to look for is Lewy pathology. This is this is the term that we use now um, pathologically to describe the presence of alpha synuclein positive Lewy bodies and Lewy neurites. So this is from a, a relatively recent uh, consensus paper. Like tau and amyloid in in Lewy pathology, um, the pathology progresses in typically kind of a stereotypical fashion. Um, from olfactory, which we don't sample typically, um, amygdala to the brainstem to other limbic structures, and then neocortical with, with, with this sort of being associated with an increasing association with dementia or cognitive impairment. Now, the, the term Lewy body is not, does not imply a clinical diagnosis, but it's, you know, it's commonly when we see it in these cases associated with the clinical syndrome of dementia with Lewy bodies, but it's also the pathology that would be in Parkinson's disease or Parkinson's disease dementia. And of course, patients can have this pathology and other uh, clinical findings as well. Now, what they describe in this criteria consensus paper is that if you have even a single Lewy body or a single Lewy neurite, which I will show you some examples, um, in a cortical section, you're, you're kind of up to this highest stage of neocortical. Uh, so I want to go back to this H&E stain section of the substantia nigra. And um, this here on H&E is, is a Lewy body. So of course, we're we do this rigorously and we prove it by staining it for alpha synuclein, but that's there's, those are easily recognizable on H and E stain sections. Um, and if I stain that substantia nigra with um, alpha synuclein, we have abundant Lewy bodies. Here's one, 
Here's another one. There are these little cytoplasmic inclusions. And all these things in the background are Lewy neurites. Uh, so just because our criteria are very simple to apply, I'll skip right ahead to the most important part, which is the frontal cortex. And we have that exact, I'm sorry, we have that exact same pathology here, Lewy bodies and Lewy neurites. So we are the highest phase of Lewy pathology or the highest stage of Lewy pathology, which we call uh, neocortical or diffuse neocortical. Now, before we move on, there's a few um, other important things that I want to talk about. One is I mentioned that this patient had um, what looks to be uh, hippocampal sclerosis, and that term has kind of evolved over time. Um, a common definition of hippocampal sclerosis uh, by itself, and there's no agreed upon consensus definition, uh, is that it's loss of neurons in the hippocampus that are out of proportion to the rest of the pathology in the brain. So here we have extensive uh, AD and Lewy pathology, but we do also have this notable loss of, of neurons here. Um, and this was a, so we, we use a different stain now for our TDP43. At the time, it was a, a non-phosphorylated stain. So normal, normal expression would be in the nucleus and abnormal TDP43 aggregates in the cytoplasm. So this is a, this is a cell here in the hippocampus where you can see this is the nucleus right here. It's blue, which means it's negative. There's no TDP43 in the nucleus of this, of this neuron but it has abnormally aggregated into, um, into the cytoplasm here. And uh, I only showed you the one picture, but it was in the amygdala hippocampus and not in the frontal cortex. This finding um, is what we call late or limbic predominant age-related TDP43 encephalopathy. Um, and this is, this is important and kind of interesting in this case because it um, late when it is seen on its own is typically in um, patients over 80. And it, it usually presents with an amnestic syndrome that is, is similar to Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment. Um, so there was some debate over whether we should be making this diagnosis in the setting of other pathologies. And the most recent uh, consensus paper on this has, has said that we should continue to report uh, late uh, together when there are other pathologies, partly because there are studies that show that when you see late, um, in addition to something else, it's it's additive, so it it can it, it it's associated with an increased burden of of cognitive impairment uh, on top of what you would see without it. Um, the other part that's noteworthy is that the latest consensus papers have also said uh, that when late is accompanied by hippocampal sclerosis, it not it is not always accompanied by loss of those hippocampal neurons. That's also associated with more severe cognitive impairment. So to the extent that late is playing a role here, it's it's uh, a relatively um, that's that's kind of an additive component. Uh, we stage late uh, from one, two to three, three being when it involves the frontal cortex, and it did not in this case. Uh, so we have three neuropathologic diagnoses, and I just want to go back to one last little point, which was this, um, uh, the fact that we had some vascular amyloid that I showed you in the frontal cortex. Um, and then how do we explain this, you know, this little hemorrhagic lesion that was in the temporal lobe very superficially? Well, if we look at this section with the amyloid, um, there's quite advanced amyloid deposition around that bleed. So I suspect, uh, you know, I think the, the best the hypothesis is that um, that these small superficial hemorrhages are probably uh, amyloid related, and uh, and there was extensive, severe, and diffuse uh, amyloid deposition in vessels uh, throughout the brain. So these are kind of our four diagnoses. We have Alzheimer's disease at a high level, diffuse neocortical Lewy pathology, uh, late stage two with hippocampal sclerosis, and cerebral amyloid angiopathy with. Uh, associated with with cortical hemorrhages. Um, so we can put up, I have a poll we can put up and see what people think uh, fits best for this patient. All right, and it looks like 
I think most people, I guess, um, most people have come down on the on the um, mm -hmm. idea that it's mixed or there are multiple uh, contributing pathologies here, which which I agree with. And I think, um, you know, it's it's kind of an, an ongoing area of understanding how these things uh, relate. And I would say definitely in this case, these are these are the predominant pathologies, these two, the AD and the Louis pathology. Um, these other things likely contributed in some fashion, um, but it's difficult to kind of ascertain that when you have these two very severe pathologies. And I would say, how do we how do we resolve those two? And we don't have a good answer for that, nor is it, nor may it be really um, ever practical to resolve that question. Um, but one thing that I kind of rely on in these cases is, um, uh, you know, what has been discussed um, in the in the most recent consensus report from the DLB consortium is that uh, you can compare the AD pathology to the Louis pathology to come up with the the answer to this, which is very carefully worded, is what is the likelihood that the pathologic findings are associated with a typical DLB syndrome? So this is not saying which one explains the pathology, um, but it's saying uh, which one you know, how do you, what cases are most likely associated with uh, dementia with Lewy bodies uh, syndrome? In a case like this, where you have the highest level of both pathology, it's kind of hard to predict. So um, some people with this type of pathology will have a, have a typical dementia with Lewy body syndrome, um, and many may just have a more uh, AD type picture. So, so we don't really have a great uh, answer to, you know, at the end of the day, which one of these two is the is the pathologic answer, but they're both um, contributing here. So any questions? I don't know, Roger, if you had a question. I see yeah, you yeah, so I that was a really nice presentation. I just wanna make the comment. So I guess I would phrase the question a little differently. I said, I would say at, at which point in the patient's yeah. course does the pathology explain its features? And um, I guess I it's, you know, taking this, this these recent stuff from the Mayo Imaging Group at face value, um, it's, it's plausible that uh, perhaps late he had th this late was actually the dominant pathology early on and all this other stuff comes later um dream and acting behavior is very specific for um for for louis pathology and um you know, that seems to have been a later feature though we don't know whether he, how carefully he is he and his spouse were asked about this early in his course but he was seen by really super competent clinicians so i suspect it was interrogated yeah. Yeah. I was very intrigued when you made that point about uh, mm -hmm. late earlier on, because I think that's a, especially yeah. given that he had this, you know, b border between MCI mm -hmm. and, and dementia early on and, and something that maybe fit better with that. And of course, we have no way of knowing with now yeah. with our single time point of these cases, um, which of these developed first and in, and in what in what fashion they they developed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's that's a great point. Uh, can, I, can I make a comment? Uh, two comments. One, one question. Uh, hippocampal sclerosis, we see this in epilepsy. Is there a TDP43 pathology associated ever with, with epilepsy hippocampal sclerosis? No, and people have looked into that. Um, and I think that's entirely uh, sort of an accident of history <laughs> that, uh, that they got the same name. And in fact, uh, hippocampal sclerosis, so before, before we started calling it late, you know, there were various papers coming out calling it, being very careful and saying hippocampal sclerosis of the elderly or of the oldest old, or there were all these different terms to distinguish it from hippocampal sclerosis of, of epilepsy. And, and one point I will make is in epilepsy, it typically uh, is loss of the CA1 and or CA4 layers, which in, in late, mm -hmm. it tends to be uh, CA2 and CA3. Mm -hmm. um, but people have looked into that question and it's it, it appears to be a, a completely different, you know, pathologic uh, process. And I did want to make a comment. When we speak about um, ATN uh, sort of uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, descriptions of Alzheimer's now, we're talking about neurodegeneration. We have a CA2 hippocampal sclerosis here with neurodegeneration. But as you said, the brain is a pretty darn big brain. With all of this pathology, this individual had an intact brain with respect to volume. Now, we don't know whether it shrunk over time. And I'd be curious to know, Roger, if there's serial imaging that we could see whether there's some shrinkage. But I, I'm kind of struck by the lack of significant loss of, if you will, brain matter and maybe neurons, despite these multi-pathologies. Well, well, actually, Hank, it's interesting. You actually saw him. And at one point, I think you obtained a 
CT scan, I think because he'd had a couple falls or something. And you comment in your note is that there's little evidence that he's had progressive loss of, of brain volume. <laughs> so. well, well, at least I'm consistent then. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think it's it's very, and I've, I've recently, right. I recently had a similar case. And I think it's very interesting to me that atrophy, which, you know, we can assess it to some extent, but but we don't have clear measures of it pathologically um, other than our kind of semi-quantitative gross evaluation. Um, but atrophy is nowhere in our uh, staging of these diseases. Our pathologic staging is entirely based on the distribution of the protein. Yes. Um, and that may not always, you know, the, the patient's symptoms are probably better explained nice. by their by the atrophy and what areas have lost neurons. So I think that's a, this is a really interesting case for kind of illustrating that point. Yeah, absolutely. I want to get to Cindy's comment. I just want to say that certainly those of us who can't see the brain in real time, we see only imaging. We, we look very much at the regional size of, of, of brain regions to see if there might be atrophy as a driver of neurodegeneration. So, or a sign of neurodegeneration. So it's very important to us clinicals. Cindy. Thanks. I just had a question uh, for the clinicians. I'm curious if, if you're talking about late at all with patients in clinic, um, how often, how you might explain it if you do? Well, yes, I'm, I'm gonna start off, but I'm sure that, that uh, David and others have something to say, but if it's someone over 80 and they have a, a significant amnestic syndrome, um, I will tell them that this could be an Alzheimer's process or it could be something called late, and I describe them both. Um, because they're both very common in that group. Now, this individual had profound amnestic syndrome quite young, and I would not have even thought about thinking of late. So I don't know, Navid, do you have thoughts? Or Roger? Yes. I mean, the, yeah, the age definitely makes a difference, but also progression. I mean, I've had patients that for the last five years, they have had memory difficulty, but everything else in their cognitive profile has been, you know, uh, pretty strong. Uh, they're still able to, I mean, this is a very poor measure, but they're still able to draw that clock perfectly fine. And I don't have any other evidence that there's anything going on in the posterior parietal region. It's pretty much all, you know, medial temporal lobe with memory. And if they're not really progressing much over five years, I start to have that conversation with them that, hey, maybe this is perhaps more, you know, along the late pathology. Um, that's pretty much the main thing that I use. How does it change like treatment planning or your approach to care and management? Does it? Well, I mean, right now with the you know availability of you know uh, amyloid PET scan, um, you know, it sort of makes me want to find out what's going on more. I don't. I mean, then that potentially can have an effect on whether you offer anti-amyloid therapy. That's not the other thing is that I think patients. Uh, for better or worse, knowing, you know, where the disease is going to go, uh, it helps them a bit. Um, you know, the level of dysfunction that I've seen, I mean, obviously with Alzheimer's versus late is very different. Um, so I think it makes a difference in that sense too. Yeah. And I think it's something that I would add to this kind of point is that uh, the, the fact that it's it's common in my experience to see late in association with other pathologies in patients of this age range and uncommon to see it as the sole pathology in a patient you know in this 50s or 60s probably and i think would be an argument that it's you know a, a secondary process that may have you know may develop in these cases in association with the other proteinopathies well, um, we will we'll never know in this case whether there was some TD before pathology early uh, right. to describe the amnestic syndrome, but what a fascinating case. Yeah. We are at that witching hour, Stephanie. We probably should call it quits. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, coming out today. This is a really interesting case. Um, please join us for our next CPC conference. Um, it'll be April 19th, and I'll be sending out reminders for that. Um, and be sure to fill out the evaluation so you know what kind of... Um, cases you guys are interested in looking at in the future. So with that, I'll end things and have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks, everybody.